when Delene was talking about mothers made me remember. Oh, us, we were seven of us. We were all angels. So I, <laughs> but my mom, she, she, she was the angel, believe me. Sort of like the Bible spoils. They were all angels too, right? This morning, uh, I'm reading from Psalms, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on the, his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers, not so the wicked. They are like chaff that wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of wicked will perish. Here in the God's holy word. Yeah, Ronnie said that uh, there were seven of you and you guys were all angels, right? Yeah. Um, there are only two of us, and I can tell you that one of us was an angel, um, and the other one is me. So, uh, this week we will finish up our series on how we worship and how that worship can produce fruit for the kingdom. We have discussed our need to make sure we are using our time wisely. For worship, and we have discussed how when we love others, especially those that are difficult to love, we are worshiping the Lord by fulfilling his commandment to love others as he has loved us. So this week we will look at the question of what or who is it that you worship? Now, you may be thinking, uh, when you hear that, uh, what or who is it that you worship, you might be saying, well, what kind of question is that? You know, is this the pre-kindergarten Sunday school class, right? Uh, surely you can challenge us with a much more difficult question, Pastor. Don't insult us with such an obvious question. Who is it that we worship? Well, I think we believe that it seems to be an obvious question to answer, but it can be a bit more muddled than we want to believe when we answer it honestly. Now, you might also be thinking to yourself, well, if that is the question of who or what do we worship, and we've been doing a sermon series on worship, Shouldn't that have been the first thing we talked about? Wouldn't it have made sense that that is where we started the sermon series? And that's a good question. Um, but as I thought about it more, I believe that today is the day that we need to talk about just that. After all, if we are asking ourselves to consider how we worship and who we worship and how we can produce fruit for the kingdom of God, then I guess we should start by answering that basic question of who is it that we worship? Now, you may end up viewing this sermon as a bit of a primer on what it is to be a member of the United Methodist Church. And I think that that isn't such a bad thing to do to cover that. After all, even those of you that have been lifelong members of a denomination can learn something new about it. So let us start with what it is that the United Methodist Church believes as far as who we worship. There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body or parts, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. 
And in the unity of this Godhead, there are three persons, one of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Son, who is the Word of the Father, the very and eternal God, of one substance with the Father, took man's nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, so that two whole and perfect natures, that is to say, the Godhead and manhood, were joined together in one person, never to be divided, whereof is one Christ, very God and very man, who truly suffered, was crucified, dead and buried, to reconcile his Father to us, and to be a sacrifice, not only for our original guilt, but also for the actual sins of men. Christ did truly rise again from the dead, and took again his body with all things appertaining to the perfection of man's nature, wherewith he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth until he return to judge all men at the last day. The Holy Ghost, proceeding from the Father and the Son, is of one substance, majesty and glory with the Father and the Son, very and eternal God. Now maybe those statements are something that you have heard uh, in the past, and maybe not. Um, I hope that you can tell that it's not something that I just wrote out for you to hear today, um, because you probably were able to guess that I don't say sitteth, or wherewith in my uh, usual tone of speaking, uh, right? I don't speak in Old Testament language. Uh, but in case you didn't quite recognize them, those are the first four articles of religion for the United Methodist Church. The first four articles of religion for the United Methodist Church. Now, there are a further 21 articles of religion for the church. Uh, and I would encourage you to read them all for yourselves, but for the sake of time today, I won't read all of them for you. But I chose to cover the first four today because I believe they answer the question very clearly, who it is that we worship. And I chose to read those four articles today because there has been a lot of talk and a lot of misinformation about the United Methodist Church over the past 10 years, and if we're being truly honest, since the foundation of the United Methodist Church. Now, I know that most of you are aware of the rulings that have come out of General Conference. I know that some of you will be happy with the decisions. I know that some of you will be unhappy with the decisions. I know that some of you are going to go home and Google General Conference, United Methodist Church, so you can understand what it is that I am talking about to you today. And I know that some of you, as a result of this, are going to need time to decide if you can still be part of the United Methodist Church. I cannot, and I will not, try and persuade you one way or the other. It is a question that you must decide for yourself and one that you need to talk over with God. Know that if you choose to leave because of the decisions that were made at General Conference, we will miss you terribly. Each and every time someone chooses to leave the church, it is absolutely heartbreaking to the body. It is as if we have lost a part of ourselves. But also know that we will respect your right to go and worship where you feel you need to be. Know that if you choose to come back at some point, as long as I serve as pastor here, you will be welcomed back with open arms. However, you need to know that those articles of religion not just the first four that I read for you today, but all 25 of them have not changed, despite what you may have heard. See, we believe in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that Jesus was born unto the Virgin Mary, lived, died, and was resurrected. 
We believe that he sits at the right hand of God, and we believe that our salvation is found in him through the grace of God. We believe in the Holy Spirit and that it moves among us still. Brothers and sisters, those things have not changed. And you need to know that. You need to know that because I have heard of other churches that are trying to recruit members that have said that the UMC no longer believes in the Holy Trinity. And while I have chosen to remain silent up until this point, I feel I no longer can. So if you do choose to leave, if you choose to leave, do so because of something that is actually true and not because of misinformation or half-truths that some people have decided to use in order to build their church. I am here to tell you today that this church believes in the Holy Trinity. Now, if a day comes that the UMC does not believe in the Holy Trinity and know that I do not believe that day will ever come. But if it does ever come, I will walk out those doors with you and we will find a new place to be. Now, one of the things we do as pastors is we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how it is that we can grow a church. It's something that we do as members of the leadership team and planning committee, right? We talk about how it is we can bring people into the church. How can we grow the church? We spend a lot of time on this issue. Well, the truth is, it's not actually that hard. Yes, you heard that correctly. It is not actually that hard to grow a church. And you might be thinking, well, if it's not that hard, why isn't the church full every Sunday? Well, to grow a church quickly and easily, it is simple. I will give you the formula. You choose to focus on something that people have strong feelings about, like money or politics. Then you choose to side with the most supporters in your area, so you find out what most people believe or feel, and you side with those people. And then every Sunday, you preach on that particular topic, and you tell the people that they are always right. And you tell the people that God is going to bless them with financial gains if they just give all they have to the church. You hammer it home every Sunday after Sunday, and then you go into the community and you spout the same rhetoric, and you will see how fast the church will grow. Every person that has that same opinion will love to come and hear about how they are right and the other person is wrong. Now, I said it is easy to build a church, right? To grow the amount of people in the pews. Well, what I didn't say is that is the right way to build a church. What is missing from that message? What is missing from those churches we see on television? They're very good at preaching the gospel of prosperity and the gospel of money and how the Lord will give you more money than you could ever need. They are very good at preaching about politics, but they lack the gospel of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, that is what this world needs. It needs to know about Jesus, not about how to make a few more dollars, not about how right they are all the time. They need to know about the Savior that died and was raised up for them and how that had to happen because they are not right all the time. So the question of who we worship or who we should be worshiping is a simple answer. It is the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the questions we must ask ourselves is this. It is, is that who we are worshiping? Are we letting other things get in the way? Are we letting other people get in the way? Are we worshiping at the altar of money or fame or idolatry or politics? Once again, I cannot answer that question for you. That is for you and God to work out. But 
here is the good news. If you have found yourself worshiping at the wrong altar, there is still time to change. Come back. Come back and worship the God who cares for you, who knows the number of hairs upon your head, the God who sent his son to die for you so that you can be with him, the God that sent his Holy Spirit to this earth to help lift you up and guide you in his ways. That is the God that we worship here. Let us do so with all our hearts, all our minds, and all our souls. Amen. My challenge for you this week is this. Answer the question, honestly, who is it that I worship? If there is any doubt, come back to the Father this week.